And, uh, I'm doing a magazine article for uh, the AAW Journal on uh, on the story we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and I, I don't have it really made up for us tonight complete, but it's I have like a little, uh, what do you call it, PowerPoint thing. And uh, hopefully it'll just kind of give you some new ideas about where we live and the walnut trees that grow here and uh, maybe where to find some. So anyway, so I was down in Wheatland uh, taking pictures of some uh, excavators pulling up a really big uh, orchard, uh, very old, 75, 80 year old trees. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is um, most ag industry here in California has all, has all been taken over by big business. And the bottom line is making money. And the, I, I guess I don't have to get on with this whole story, but um, the, the wood that we use, a lot of the walnut, the really fancy, big, burly walnuts that uh, Northern California is famous for, are pretty much going to disappear in the next 100 years. And uh, you, we might be lucky to see one in somebody's yard someday, but uh, all those trees are being removed now. And replanted with different varieties and then they're very vigorous trees and they they grow real fast and after 25 years they'll be removed uh, and the trees will probably only be about 12 inches in diameter um, and they remove them of course just because they, they become less productive uh, and so they do, and they and they of course they plant them a lot closer now um, and of course they water them and in the Wal the walnut industry in California, Northern California has been pretty special because you can grow a walnut tree without watering them. So, uh, and we'll refer to that as dry farming, which is more of a sought after uh, egg item, obviously, because water is expensive and you, you actually, not, not watering certain fruits is a better thing. It, you, you concentrate flavors and things like that. So. Uh, some of the, if, if you drive up here in the Shenandoah Valley or, you know, down in Lodi and see all those vineyards, you every once in a while, you'll come across one that's not watered. And those are, uh, those are again, dry farmed. And uh, the farmers are charging a premium for that fruit because it's much more concentrated sugar wise and probably a better quality fruit than the ones that they water. So anyway, well, heck, let's, let's get on with our presentation. Um, Anybody have any questions and want to chat on any, any subject before I start? I have a quick question for you, Mike. So, I th but I think you answered it, but you said that 85 year old trees, is that about the lifespan for the walnut? So before they start, they stop producing or? It's not that they don't stop producing. They're just not as vigorous. And again, like it's a bottom line thing. Um, walnut trees will produce for hundreds of years if left alone. It's just, they're not, they're not, not uh, enough. They're not paying the rent. So they, uh, they have to keep constantly stay on this. And UC Davis has got everything down to a science, a, a continuous science, but um, it's not always a good thing. Uh, you can only imagine the, the, the chemicals and things and, and just the way, uh, how productive things have to be. Um, I, I always wonder, you know, I, I, I don't quite get it because I don't, I don't, um, I, I'm a wood turner. It's not like I was ever going to get rich. <laughs> so I, I just use what I have and, and work with what I got. So anyway, uh, but get, apparently uh, these these big farms have have stockholders and they have to produce. Mm. But anyway, any other questions out there? Um, hey, Mike. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are those trees you saw? Are they going to be used? Are they going to be plowed under? What's going to happen with them? A uh, very small percentage of them. There's so many of them. Uh, that uh, and the guys who actually remove those really can't deal with small timers uh, like they, they'll deal with me a little bit just because I can go in there and kind of charm them with a, a bowl and things like that and, uh, kind of befriend them but um, they, these guys want to sell uh, uh, tractor trailers full of, of logs and burls and then and the worst part about it is the market for fine grade veneers is, is, is really dried up. Um, there's, uh, there's, it's really an interesting speculative issue. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures here. I might as well. Um, I'm gonna, let me see if I can share my screen. This is, this wasn't part of the program. 
and you're not you're not seeing the screen right or what I want to show you yet. But I'm gonna, I'm just gonna look uh, while I'm talking to you here. I'm gonna try to find <clears throat> some video that I took today, and this is completely unedited. But let me see here. Just um, give you an idea. So let's share my screen. Let's get back to that. What's the diameter of a 75-year-old walnut tree? Oh, they can get as big as Volkswagens, really. Wow. Um, wow. So you're looking at, I'm trying to find a video here. These these could be just images here. So that's my buddy Skyler. And, I don't know, but I've got no sound. Excuse me? No sound? Uh, the, there's no video yet playing, so there won't that's be That's okay. Sound. Yeah, no, no, I'm just going to show you some images. Yeah. This is uh, Skyler Phelps, who's a backhoe got operator but this tree's already been dug up by an excavator and that's got a you kind of you kind of see the top of the trunk there with the english walnut trees there and he's pulling that up he's going to shake the dirt off of it if he likes it he's going to high pressure wash it and uh <clears throat> let me uh, let's just see if, what, what else i can show you here they it looks like a war zone these trees have just been yanked out of the ground and these are just you know they're real burly um, let's see, you can see uh, right here, um, this guy right here is called an onion, and that's just a pure burl. And it doesn't look that big, but it's probably five, four or five foot diameter. Wow. And that's a, that's a veneer quality burl. That's, uh, let me, there's, I know there's some video here. Maybe we don't even need it, but let's. Like I said, all unedited stuff. Let's show you some more pictures. There's a big burl. Uh, and then, um, let's, let's see if I can, this might be a video here. Nah, okay. Well, these guys, these are the trees that have been cut down, but they haven't pulled out of the ground yet. And you can see, um, notice how, um, notice how the, this black area here is, 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 kind of burly and that is the california walnut there and they they this part of the tree has been grafted to that and it's a it's not nearly the vigorous grower that the base is and so this tree gets a, a disease called crown root gall and that's what that is um it's not great for the tree but it's great for the woodworker because the uh, uh that wood is all very figured beautiful stuff and we'll I think we got to, I should go on with my presentation because uh, I'm going to spoil everything that uh, <laughs> we talked about. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. I, uh, just let me stop share, find my uh, document here. Any questions on that while we're, we're going? Hey, Mike, um, I heard that uh, the walnut farmer or the people that are doing that, they just burn the tree, the top of the tree. They just put it out there and then just burn it in uh, a couple of months. Is that true? That's true. Uh, they were burning burls uh, the top of the trees today. And um, let's, uh, let's, so yeah, they had fires going there today and they were just burning the tops and they were burning the English walnut varieties. That's the top of the tree and that's the one that cr creates the nuts. So you, here's my presentation, uh, a walnut story, my relationship with walnut wood. And when I was a young, real, kid really i i turned my first piece of walnut one of the first pieces i turned was walnut um just because i grew up next to a, a walnut orchard so the wood was always available um and then i i think the next piece i turned was a pistachio uh and pistachio i grew uh grew right up across the street from a pistachio orchard in elk grove and those trees were 94 years old when they cut them down for a subdivision uh, they, they were fabulous. They were two, two and a half foot diameter. If you ever seen pistachio wood? It's gorgeous stuff. Uh, looks like Bacote, uh, but it's it it's very similar to walnut in in its workability. Well, anyway, here here's my presentation. So let I'm gonna get kind of get technical, but don't it's not gonna go over anybody's head. And if it does, it's no big deal. Juglans is the walnut variety, uh, uh, the species. Uh, or the family juglans and juglan in latin that means ju is it means jupiter so god uh jupiter's a god and glands meaning acorn so uh god's acorn <laughs> 
it, in literal translation, glands actually means nuts, but it doesn't sound as good when you say God's That's nuts. nuts. So <laughs> it's kind a couple, of couple, of couple ways to take that one. <laughs> hey, Sorry, Mike, uh, question. Uh, I don't know uh, Apple products that well, but can you do that into a slideshow view or, or a little bigger zoom for some people that may have a smaller screen? Yeah, I, I don't think I can, uh, okay. Chris, because if I do, it's going to block. Um, I haven't quite figured this out, but I have a drawing program here. And if I go to oh, that, I got screen, you. it's going to blow out my, my drawing, drawing program. program. Gotcha. Okay. I, I can try it, though. You know, let's do it. It's been a while since I tried it. Let's... What about on the top left? It says Zoom 50%. What if you made that like 75? There's 78 there. Yeah, there you go. Oh, but I gotta much. go back. No, that's right. I'm gonna. Um... Ah, there's my drawing program. That's too much. Let's go to seventy-five. That better? Yeah, that's better. But oh, my drawing bar is here in the way. I don't know if you can see can my you, drawing bar. Can you drag it? Yep. Yeah. There you go. That's good. Okay. So yep. anyway, um, there there are more than two dozen species of juglans, walnuts, around the world, and that's not a, a whole lot of variety for a tree. Uh, if you think about other uh, other uh, families of trees like pop, uh, poplars or uh, oaks, even there's hundreds of varieties of those trees. And what would cause that? And um, the reason is is that the walnut is not a very adaptable tree. It only grows in certain areas. <clears throat> and if you think about trees that you see out and about, uh, they're products of the same thing. The 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 reason we have walnuts here or walnuts. Oaks, let's just say, oak is a, it was one of the most uh, abundant trees on all of the continents of the world. It's because it's very adaptable. It grows at sea level and goes all the way up into five, 6,000 foot elevations. And then it could adapt to um, cold and, and hot that uh, other trees can't. So um, walnut's not a very diverse species uh, of tree. Um, commercially, there are four valuable species. Juglans regia, which is English walnut, and those are the nuts that we eat. Um, Juglans nigra, black walnut, which grows east of here from, let's say, uh, the eastern slope of Sierra all the way to uh, the east coast up to about uh, Canada. And then California is very unique in the sense that it has its own uh, species of walnut, and that's Hinzii, Clara or California walnut. Um, Hines uh, was a botanist from Scotland, I believe, and he, the, the tree was named after him because he was the first one to recognize it. I, I think in the, don't quote me on this, but I think he was part of a, uh, an, um, an English, what was the name of that boat? Um, the Vancouver. Uh, I think there were three trips from the Vancouver, and he was one of the botanists on those, and there was a lot of other named botanists on those ships. Uh, Douglas, uh, if I say out those names and you don't know what they are, uh, you may have heard of a Douglas fir. Uh, Douglas was one of the botanists on, the, mm -hmm. on those trips. Um, who would be some other famous ones? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I could think of some of them, but the names are so twisted that uh, many of us would, would never, you, just, you would just r roll your eyes. Anyway, you get the idea. That's how, by the way, you see how, um, it says Juglans Hinzii eye with the two eyes on the end. When you see two eyes on the end, that means it was named after an individual. When you see uh, a, a scientific name where it doesn't have the double eye, it's usually named after a thing or a place. Just, so, just if you're interested in those sorts of things. Uh, let's see, so we have um, uh, back in the 1880s, we had a gentleman by the name of Luther Burbank uh, who came to California from New England. And he was a uh, botanist as well. And he crossed the California walnut with the black walnut and created a tree called uh, Paradox or Bastone. And his, his idea for that tree was um, that it would become a shade tree uh, because the, uh, the tree grew really fast. Uh, he, he, uh, studied the tree, and I think in eight years he had a 20 inch diameter tree. Uh, so it was a very fast grower and it had really broad leaves. And if you're, if you've got an eye for it, and you go all over Sacramento and especially in some of the more agricultural towns, uh, I'm thinking of, say, Elk Grove, even, or uh, what used to be an agricultural town, keep going down to 
Galt, Lodi, Merced, uh, all those places. And you can see paradox trees all over the valley and they're fabulous trees because they grow so fast. Um, Actually, I'm gonna uh, let me show you a picture of a tree in uh, uh, Manteca. Um, that is a hundred-year-old uh, oh. paradox tree uh, or bastone tree, which is the cross of the California walnut and the black walnut. So a huge tree. That's uh, that's my friend uh, Walt there. He's he's a walnut grower. He has uh, 500 acres in, uh, or did have 500 acres in. Uh, in Stanislaus County, I believe. Uh, I think I had a little uh, internet problem there. Am I doing okay, Chris? No, you're doing fine. Sounds good. Um, view's good. Okay. So um, any questions on that? Mike, I had a question. I, I don't know why I keep coming up with questions, but <laughs> maybe I'll encourage some others. Um, so uh, I know, like, would the oaks, for example, you know, I can tell the I different tell oaks the different by the size of the... Size. Um, acorn and the shape of the cap and um, ha, uh, what are the ways that you differentiate the different walnuts? Yeah, it's, it's not real easy because even though there's very few varieties of them, they do interact and breed together and they will create different leaf patterns between like the Claro walnut that grows here on my property is relatively different uh, than the Claro walnuts that I see down in the valley. So there are subtle differences. Mm. Uh, the nuts are relatively the same. Uh, I do have a picture of that. Um, the, the Claro walnut would have that thin bipinnate leaf. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the uh, European or Asian walnut, the English walnut has a really broad leaf. And then of course the cross, the uh, Paradox cross as an even bigger leaf than the English walnut leaf, and it's uh, so. If you're interested, keep your eye out for it. And why did he call it paradox? He called it a paradox because the tree grew uh, immensely fast, and he had the smarts to actually test all the the wood, and he tested the hardness of the tree. And the paradox, even though it grew faster than the normal walnut, was actually harder and denser than the slower growing. California walnut. So just a um, an interesting uh, tidbit uh, about the paradox tree. And also, of course, since like species, when they're bred together, they don't produce offspring, so they become sterile. And that's the beauty of the paradox tree, because that's why it would be such a nice shade tree, because um, it didn't produce a nut. And if you've ever been unfortunate enough to live next to a, a black walnut tree or a clara walnut tree, you, you li you're living with ball bearings outside your door. Uh, they're, they'll kill you if, you if you walk on them. So something to think about. So just in casual conversation, we talk about English walnuts all the time. And you go to uh, the nursery and say, I want an English walnut tree. And you'll, they'll, they'll lead you to the one uh, that produces an English walnut tree, but it's really not English at all. It, it, it came from Persia, and there's probably more varieties in, uh, in Persia than anywhere, and that's Iran, of course, and, and Afghanistan ha has its share of uh, this type of walnut as well. Um, but every time you buy that walnut, you're going to buy the graft. You're going to buy the California rootstock, melded with the English walnut, a variety of English walnut. And the reason is, is the that particular variety of tree doesn't grow well in our soil. Uh, it will grow, uh, but not real healthy. It's not real vigorous. And they, they, they kind of turn bushy and then they kind of die after 15, 20 years. They get a, a mildew in the root system. So that's why they create uh, uh, a different root stock. And that's true for just about all varieties of fruit and nut trees that you see anywhere uh, in California. They always choose the, the strongest root stock uh, to go with the premier, uh, the the best or the I'm trying to think of the the fruit name the the premium fruit whatever that premium fruit is and that and the, what the interesting thing about grafting to a rootstock is um, so uh, let's just say today Zinfandel is the grape the wine that everybody loves and ten years from now everybody's going to, you know, they'll put out a movie and then somebody will say, I hate Zinfandel. <laughs> Next thing you know, nobody likes Zinfandel. Uh, they'll, they'll cut those things off. And this happens all over the valley, right? 
as we're talking, they're cutting whatever varieties uh, that aren't being popular and they're going to put a new, another variety that is popular right onto that rootstock and it'll produce fruit in two years and it'll, it'll be right mm. back to normal because you've got that big root structure and it'll pop out uh, uh, that little graft that they stick on that grape will get as big as the the actual grape just in a couple of years and that's true here on my farm I've uh, I graft uh, apple trees and cherry trees and you know some sometimes you get you plant a tree and it just isn't vigorous or it produces poor fruit. Um, you can, you can cure that by grafting another variety to it. So like I have a couple cherry trees that I really like and a cherry tree next to it that produces a really hard red fruit that never tastes good. The birds love it. But so I cut that whole tree down to the base and then I attach the new variety from the trees next door to it and force those. And within just at the uh, end of the summer, those, those things are two inches in diameter on the trunk. So the, and then they, they become really strong and then you've got a new tree in just a couple of years. So interesting, but that's been going on for, for centuries. So the English walnut is not English at all. We know that uh, the black walnut grows, I already told you where it grows, east, uh, east of the Sierras. Uh, Hinsiae grows here in the fertile valleys of Northern California. And then we are, yeah, she's, I already showed us. Anyway, okay, so this is kind of uh, uh, the, the orchard here on the left. Um, you can see the vigorous California rootstock, and then again, the, the English walnut on the top here growing out of it. And uh, of course, this is where the burls are down in here. And these trees are spaced about 40 feet apart. These originally grew as dry farm trees, and you have to um, uh, space them that far apart to make them, uh, you know, to, to divide up the water that Mother Nature is going to give them. And I do that here on my property. I dig what I dig about a hundred foot basin uh, out uh, on my driveway or where I'm going to put these trees. And then I plant three or four uh, Claro walnut nuts in a hole. And then uh, that, I do this in the wintertime, of course, and then uh, they sprout up in the spring and the strongest one I keep and then I cut out the others. And then about a, another year later, I'm going to cut um, those. They're, they're about as big as big around as my finger, maybe 18 to 36 inches tall. And I'm going to graft them with an English walnut tree that's here on my property. Uh, I do that a lot here. And, and, uh, and of course, up here, I've got to keep the deer away from them. Um, and then notice this is a modern um, walnut orchard tree. And notice that's a 15 foot space. And then the next tree again is 15 feet down the line. Um, these are going to be watered and they're also going to be mechanically harvested and pruned. Um, so there'll be very little uh, labor that takes care of these. And of course these trees will be torn out in 25 years and replaced. So, the, the trees on the left there are boons for people like me who, who make that wood into their, their, their product. Um, and, you know, I'm not in my lifetime going to see these go away, but um, it's rapidly happening all over the valley here. Um, the, the people who, who have these orchards who are interested in making money, they're going to have to remove these out. And, and replant them like the ones you do on the right. Now, where the water is going to come from, I don't know. Um, uh, that's always a pie in the sky little deal with agriculture and humans in this in this state. Well, I think it's happening everywhere, but um, who knows where the water is going to come from? They they kind of feel they have enough water now. Um, I don't know. Uh, any questions, anybody? Okay. I got a quick question again, Mike. Um, yeah. How do you, I mean, I know they harvest almonds with the shaker. How do they ha harvest walnuts if they don't mechanically do it? Uh, of course they do mechanically. It's almost identical. It's the same, same machinery. Um, if you, it's, it's fabulous to watch. It's a, it's a really low riding tractor with like a, a boom out in front of it that has this canvas that folds out and then a Great, it grabs, puts around the whole tree, you know, 30, 40 feet out. 
and then a shaker comes over the top and just drops all the walnuts on top of that tarp and then it gets sucked into this tractor and then pushed out in the back into a semi truck oh, uh, wow. incredible and they do that almost twice a year out of i'm twice a year. they do it twice uh, they, they'll shake twice in the season because uh, some of the nuts won't come off uh, on the first shake. And they do that mm -hmm. almonds. They do the same thing with almonds, and especially pistachios, because pistachios are um, a pretty finicky uh, crop to have. And that's why you don't see a lot of them, because it's, uh, it's, it's pretty pricey to, to, to make all that work. Walnuts are fairly easy. After they get picked, they have to be shucked. They have a little shucker that knocks the skin off, and then uh, they're heated, and then... Uh, Blue Diamond, uh, I think there's one other company. They buy all of them. They, 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 um, it's kind of a scam, uh, if you ask me, but it's, it's, it's big business, uh, it, a big business. I'll, I'll call it a scam. I won't call it a scam. I'll call it big business adjusting the price to what they think should be. And then the growers get what they want. Um, you're looking at an image of the, on the left there, a paradox. So, this is what a modern tree would look like. So when you're driving down the valley, notice there's not a whole lot of difference in trunk color. That, uh, the, the bottom part there is more vigorous than the upper part. Um, that is your paradox rootstock. And that's, <clears throat> that, it takes years and years and years for that walnut tree to get any color in it. Um, if you cut this tree down in 25 years, it's just white. There's no mm -hmm. figure, no nothing. But these, some of these paradox trees that are still out or that are out there that are from Luther Burbank's time, they're spectacular. They've, they've got, uh, it's more of a golden hue. I'll show you the, what the woods look like. Um, and so also what this can tell you here, um, the graft is right on the ground. Um, uh, that's, that's a product of UC Davis uh, because in the old days, you see the graft is up here uh, up about shoulder height. And that was because the farmer was grafting them right there on the site, just like I would do. So they went and stooped down on the ground to, to put that graft in. This graft on the left was done at a, at a facility in, in a pot um, and then uh, planted later. And it's, um, it, it's, it's done so scientifically now. Um, if you were to grow a walnut tree, let's just say from a nut, uh, like I do here, and you try to transplant it, good luck. The, the root does not take shock very well. And if it does live through that transplanting, uh, it'll sit for two or three years and not do much of anything. Um, <clears throat> but these folks have it down to the science where it, get, it gets off and running right away. Um, what else to tell us here? Um, th this particular one here, that was grafted with three different shoots. Uh, we call them scions. Um, and that was, uh, and then this one was done with just a single style. Um, and they, they're all kinds of different methods of how to, uh, attach these. I just use a, a sharp knife, uh, and a, a masking tape <laughs> and, and that's it. And just kind of cross my fingers and hope for the best. But these, these, these folks probably never lo lose a graft and I lose about probably 50% of them. So. Yeah, again, I'm not interested in the bottom line. I'm just interested for the experience. Um, hey Mike, let's take a look at the wood. Anybody have questions for, the, for me? Hey, Mike, I was just going to let you know, um, my uh, good friend who ended up becoming my nephew-in-law owns a 300-acre walnut farm. And uh, he told me for his grafting, they put it on and they saran wrap it to the tree to keep I've some seen moisture. That, yeah. And he said it works 100% of the time. Nice, yeah. Well, yeah. If you're in the 300 acre business, you you want it to work every time, um, and I've seen that type of method. Uh, thanks for the the question. There's all kinds of different methods. If you, uh, I, I've been nerdy enough to look at all these, and uh, it, I'm I graph differently every time. Um, it's amazing. Um, let's take a look. Question, anybody? Yeah, I in those trees, I can see a lot of bowls. Where is the stock when you go to the lumber yard and you can get 10 foot long walnut? Ah, great question. <laughs> uh, guess what? Those walnut trees are not grown in California. Uh, those are e Eastern walnut trees. Uh, if you ever <clears throat> get out into the East uh, and look how the trees grow uh, in the East as compared to out in the West, uh, in the West, the trees come out of the ground and just 
start going left, right? Everywhere but straight. If you look at a, uh, uh, a walnut tree and, or an oak tree for that matter, it'll go tall and straight right up uh, in the east, but it won't do that out here in the west. Uh, Are those different rootstock, different varieties? No, uh, those, would, those would be native trees. They don't have a, an agriculture um, uh, that I, I, I'm saying that 100%, but there probably are, are people in the East that grow walnut trees and for business, but I don't think they've got much going on. Uh, but those, those trees would be native trees, trees that grew naturally in the soil. Um, and those tall, and they produce tall and straight lumber because the tree is tall and straight. Um, we don't, um, the reason they don't make boards out of this stuff is because it's not, tall, it's not growing against the uh, gravity. <clears throat> it's not growing straight up and down with the earth. The, these branches here are reactionary grains. So if you made a board out of them, they would bend the opposite of where, uh, of the, the grain pattern that's in them. So they look like uh, big bowed boards is what they would look like. So you always want to make boards out of the trunks of the trees uh, that aren't uh, uh, going north-south against the earth. Thank you for the question. Did that, did that answer it? Mike, are you going to show us some, some pictures of the different kinds of woods of these walnuts? Yeah, uh, okay. that's up next. Um, okay. And I, and I did this in a wood turning format because we, and I, I do have some boards here that we'll talk about, but I just want to show you the difference in color. This is a, a typical Clara walnut and um, it's, it's got more of a co coffee color and you can also see this marbling, the darker lines in there. Um, that's pretty typical of Claro. And, and remember what I just said, because we're going to come back to that. This is an image of a black walnut piece. And look how much darker that is. It's, a, it's almost uh, black almost. Um, and it, this, this particular wood that you can see some grain in there, but it'll continue to darken with ultraviolet light. So um, it's not one of my favorite woods. And, and also if you've ever worked with uh, a true black walnut, the uh, Juglans nigra, it's very, very spicy and, and tough on a, on a guy with a nose like this, um, it's really uh, uh, sharp smelling and, and a lot of people have allergic reactions to it, but the California walnut isn't nearly that spicy and um, a little easier to work as well. Um, so this is our paradox here. Notice the more coppered color. It's usually lighter in color. <clears throat> and this is the, the blend, the, 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 the offspring of the uh, California and the black walnut, or uh, the, and the English walnut put together. Um, and this, uh, if you if you refer to this wood as Bastone, and I mentioned it a couple times, the price goes right up, it goes right through the roof. And I went and stopped and looked at a dealer today, um, and he he's by far has the best uh, figured walnut wood I've ever seen. And he's a nice guy, and we chatted a little bit about it. He. He showed me this beautiful piece of paradox and I said, you know, I can't imagine why anybody would pay, you know, $30 a board foot for this. And he says, he looked right at me, he goes, me either, as compared to the other walnuts, I don't get it. But it's, it's, it's kind of a, I think it's a historical reason why people would think they paid more for Bastone because it was, it's rare, I think. And then let's take a look at the English walnut, uh, much more marbly. Lighter brown, probably one of my favorite woods to work. Um, great seller for my business, um, but there's more marbling in it. And let's just kind of look at the difference in color real quick back and forth. Bronze, more of a dark color. And then let's look at the boards here. Um, English walnut here, more marbly. Um, uh, the paradox, lighter, and this is a horrible, picture of the Claro, but uh, that's all I got. And then the black wall, you can see just much more darker tones in that. Mike, in that, in that English wallet, when it's uh, polished up, does it, does it have something that I, like a transparency look in it? Sparkly transparency type look? I've got some, I, I yeah. got a quartz in it, and I, when I, when I got to the polishing end of it, it almost looked like it was transparent, 
look into the wood and yeah. uh, spot. The, all that, the walnuts have that, and that's just chatoyancy. And it's, it's a cause be, between the lighter and darker uh, colors side by side. So anytime you have colors that are different side by side and you polish it up, you'll get that chatoyancy look. And walnut is, is great in that. Um, <clears throat> good question. Anybody else? Okay, well. Yeah, just uh, that bottom right picture. What did you call that one? Black? Black wallet. Okay, so what is the lighter stuff near the edge? And is that still considered the bark or is that usable wood? Oh, it's very usable wood. Um, that's the sap wood. Um, sap. So, and you can also see the kind of sap wood here on the, on the paradox as well. Um, there are some uh, light sap areas there. Now, the contrast here is important because you, you – you would like to keep that on your work, but it won't happen unless you work with that wood immediately. Otherwise, it's going to blend into be the same color. Um, the only way to keep that color is to work with it when the free water is still in it. And um, actually, let me let me grab something here. I didn't think I was going to ha have any props here, but let me uh, let me clear that off. And then. Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to stop share here real quick. Oops, can't do that. And then I'm going to just show you a bowl. But here's a good example of um, sapwood stain on the bowl. So okay. if I did not work with this immediately, um, it would all be the same color. That, that, that uh, free uh, the free water in the wood just kind of, I, I call it turning mousy. It, it, it just makes everything look the same over time. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. So uh, Mike, a lot of folks don't know that little trick and uh, um, they see that contrast and, um, and then uh, it disappears on them. But you, you can keep it if you work with it. Same is true with any wood, uh, not just walnut. Anything that has a lot of contrast to it, uh, Get, get on it immediately and, and uh, uh, work with it. And it doesn't mean you, you have to work with it green uh, and finish it green. You can actually uh, rough turn it uh, and get a lot of that free water. You ever turn a piece of wa uh, wood and water's just shooting out of it. If you can get that out of the wood, um, that's really important to keep the, the contrasting color. Yeah, Mike. Yes, I, got a, I came across some walnut that the tree came down and I cut up some pieces. I'm still drying it. It's English walnut, but it's very, very light in color. Why is that? And the reason that is, is it was a young tree probably and the heartwood yeah. did not have time to get bigger. So a lot of times you'll see um, a, a, maybe a smaller tree where this only the sap is that big and the rest is all this lighter color. And that's just a young tree, basically. Or there are some varieties of walnut that don't produce a lot of uh, heartwood. Uh, so the, the sap ring could be uh, much bigger. And usually the sapwood of, uh, the sap wood of the tree is where all the life is. The heartwood is, is, is all dead wood cells. And this area here, it, it, the darker area here is dead. Well, it's not completely dead because there is moisture in it but it's not carrying all the vital nutrients and minerals into the tree like this, this outer area here. The outer area here is much softer and there's a lot more moisture going up and down in, in those cells than in the, the, the darker area here. And that's a good thing for the tree because that darker area being relatively dead is also harder and stiffer and that's what keeps the tree um, <clears throat> standing up and, and rigid. Um, you ever heard of a, um, a heat drop? There's a the thing that happens here all over California and, and every tree. Uh, we lose a lot more trees in the summertime uh, that fall down um, uh, in the summer than we do in the high wind areas in the winter. And the reason is, is um, uh, if you think about how a tree draws moisture up to the canopy, uh, and it, it does that if you real simple test that you can do. And this is, this is a very basic concept of how water gets up to the top of a tree. Take a paper towel 
and stick it in a, a plate of water and watch the moisture whisk up the paper. And that's exactly how a tree is, is giving moisture to its canopy in a, in a very simple sense. Um, but as it gets warmer out, it draws more moisture up into the canopy because that the thinness of, of the viscosity of, of the liquid um, gets drawn up a lot higher and, and there's a lot more of it. Then the tree gets too heavy for itself and loses a limb or something like that. Um, and that's, and again, this is all evolutionary concepts. Uh, we, you know, we have seasons here where these trees are going dormant. Well, what makes them go dormant? Uh, particularly in walnut trees, it's just the cooler temperatures. The, the moisture starts going, hey, I, I've got to get back down into the earth. And then the warmer temperature brings it up. And, and then as the moisture gets pushed down into the ground, um, uh, the leaves fall off because they, they um, uh, harden off and uh, then the whole cycle starts over again. Then the warmer temperature comes up, brings it all up. And that's generally, simply speaking, there's uh, many other reasons for it. And I'm no botanist. I just play one here on Zoom tonight. <laughs> but uh, uh, question. any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. When they talk about old growth, are they talk? Is that term used to, when you're talking back when the grafting? Is that old growth would be figure the trees that are the, the, uh, uh, in that left hand picture versus the right hand, or you know that two pictures that you had, the, the big burl growth at the bottom would be considered old growth. Well, People talk about old growth, old growth. I, I appreciate what you're saying there about old growth. I think anybody could use the term old growth for a lot of things and it, it could make sense. Um, I would call that tree on the right an old growth tree, yeah, but it, on the grand scheme of things, not too old. Uh, but when we, when we say old growth redwoods or old growth cedars, what are those typically? Those are trees that are, are virgin trees that haven't been replanted by humans. Uh, that's what it means to me. I don't, I don't know if anybody else uh, would care to differ. Uh, old growth means old growth. I've just had somebody tell me, well, this, this walnut came from old growth trees. And so, I don't know. Well, and I have some old growth. In that, in that definition, I have old growth trees here on my property that weren't planted by humans. And I, if you call those old growth, I would agree. Um, so I think that term is broad. Yeah. I was uh, Mike, told, I was told. another hey. question for you. Uh, what's the range uh, in California, uh, both altitude and geographically, of the claro before the orchards start to get planted? Was that Bill Jewell? Yes, it is. Hey, Bill, how are you? I was hearing that Good. voice. I go, wow. Well, that's that's an answer I don't have, but do you? No. Oh, I'm just wondering what pontificate on that. <laughs> Anyway, Bill, no, I think, I think, um, I think the orchards grow at all elevations in the valley, of course, and then I've seen them up as high as feet here in the foothills. Here in the foothills. Okay. But you know, yeah, you, I, the elevation, you lose, lose vigorousness too. too. I've never seen them that high. I've been fortunate to get a couple of, uh, I, I believe, uh, native grown, weren't planted. Uh, giant uh, claro uh, burls once upon a time and uh, wondering where else to hunt for them. So. Yeah, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're, they're, all, they're all over my area. Over my area. I'm getting a little feedback. Yeah, Anybody know where yeah. it's coming from? Yeah, I think it was from Bill's. I just muted him again. So. Oh, they're much better. Yeah. Well, Bill, we're going to have to shut you up then. <laughs> Good to see you, Bill, or hear you at least. Uh, I've got one more thing to add here, and then we, we'll open it up for it. Um, so an interesting historical fact, in 1869, when we completed the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, uh, early entrepreneurs learned that they could cut the native walnut trees here and ship them uh, to the Eastern furniture makers because they thought that the claro was easier to work and looked prettier. And, I, and I, I, you don't need a trained art to, to actually see that. Um, but just like the gold, uh, the walnut ran out and soon regarded uh, as endangered. And it is still today an endangered species and probably always will be. Um, and there's the, the, the two reasons for that, of course, are human agriculture and uh, deer depredation. Um, deer here, uh, well, 
back in the gold rush days here on my property, you'd be lucky to see a deer. Um, deer would be for dinner. Uh, up here now, there are plenty of deer because we're, we're uh, too kind to, to eat, eat them all. So we let them grow around and, and, and do bad things to our crops. But uh, that, that's not true. I, I do let it happen to me because uh, I, I can't, my wife literally can pet them. So, um, and they'd probably be at the vet if she had her way. <laughs> So that's all I got on Walnut, and it, thanks for indulging me on this. It's a it's a new project, and it's not nearly done. Uh, there's going to be plenty more to to talk about that. I'm going to do this on a whole bunch of different um, things. You know, just those little. It interests me. I don't know if it interests other folks. And uh, Walnut's been such a part of my life. Um, uh, I I just wanted to share what I knew about it. Yeah, Mike. This is Gary. Um, hey, Gary. Uh, can you talk about workability? How do the different species work with turning tools, if there's any difference? Yeah, there's, there's very, uh, I, they'd have to be nuanced differences to most folks. I see the difference in, in daily work. Um, I work with all the four walnuts uh, here in, in my shop. Um, I would say, um, I would, if, if I if somebody gave me a black walnut tree, a Juglans nigra, I'd say uh, great firewood, burn it. Um, but if that if you never get to work with walnut, you would never think that way. It, it's a nice wood. Um, this this the smell that it puts off. The <laughs> when I was in college, I'll give you a quick story. I turned a bunch of black walnut, and I used to turn out in my shorts in the backyard, and I had no socks on but i had tennis shoes in the the all the chips had gotten around the tongue of my ankles there and uh i worked through the day while that happened and then i went inside got cleaned up took a shower and sat down on the couch and turned the tv on and i noticed these black rings around my ankle i thought it was dying <laughs> i didn't know where they came from so that it's just a real inky wood and it smells real bad and you know, after 30 years of working with it, I, I, I'm really sensitive to the smells of wood. And uh, so I don't, and it also, um, when you're cutting end grain fiber of the black walnut, um, it's, it, it breaks off a lot more. And, and mo uh, the claro is a little better, but the English never breaks off on the end grain. And the paradox wouldn't either because it's denser. Um, so that's all, so I, that's yeah, all there, I there's different, different types and different workabilities. And they're not nearly, they're not that abrasive to tool steels at all. Another question for you, Mike. Bill Jewell here. Hi, Bill. I don't want you to give away your trade secrets, but the world famous uh, uh, olive, or I'm sorry, walnut oil that you sell. Uh, is there a difference between the Paradox or, or the English walnut in terms of the oil you're squeezing out? And yeah, most definitely. Um, it would be very chemical differences. And they're, um, the black walnut is very high in linoleic acid, uh, and that is the key fatty acid in natural oils that you'd really want to keep that level high. And uh, I've met, well, they don't make oil out of uh, uh, black walnuts or Paradox, because of course the Paradox doesn't produce a nut, a very many nuts. Uh, so the, the, all the oils that you see come from the Juglans Regia or the English walnuts and relatively low in linoleic acid, but that's all we can get. And the low, uh, the, my oil is the process to where it gets just to the refinement process where they, they stop lowering the acids. So the minute you, you, can, you can add uh, chalk, for instance, to lower the acid content to make it more pH, um, that's what's that's what's happening with culinary walnut oils. They're they're softening up the acids so they're nicer on the tongue. But again, if I was working with black walnut, you probably wouldn't. Uh, you, you'd be, have a fantastic oil, but it's just not a an agricultural crop. Told you more than you needed, right? <laughs> what else you got out there, everybody? I, I have a question. Uh, <laughs> Really related to the species, but a lot of times you use walnut as a contrasting wood against light wood, and say in segmented turning. Yep. Uh, have any tricks that you could pass our way in terms of 
keeping that blackness from contaminating your light wood uh, other than sharp tools or scrapers. You don't want to sand it, I've learned. You know, I, you're, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't done a segmented piece since I was 18. I don't know how, how I know that they must get muddied together from time to time. Anybody have an answer for that? That's a good question. Yeah, we got some segmented turners in here. Somebody ought to know something, but that's got to be a no. problem. I didn't, I didn't no. think about that. I've I've, I've turned uh, a lot of segmented bolts with uh, black walnut, and uh, no, uh, I don't have any any problem with all melting from light to dark or or vice versa. Yeah, I in fact, have there's a thing I'm going to show. Uh, and, or show and tell that I just did that has the two two woods right next to each other. It yeah, looks good. Gary, I, I haven't either. The um, the woods that tend to keep small um, uh, uh, sawdust in the pores are the ones that tend to bleed over like Paduke. Mm. And walnut tends to clear out. Uh, it seems like the pores are big enough that you can get the find sawdust out and it doesn't uh, bleed over when you put a, a finish on. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm glad I don't have that problem anyway. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Questions, hey, um, Mike, I've picked up from uh, the place in Santa Rosa and I bought English, Claro, and stuff they said was French Walnut, and he had some gun stocks there, like a full size gun stock, and just the rough stock they were going to sell for about seven fifty. A board flint? No, for the for the blank to yeah. send to somebody else to carve into the stock. So is there a is the French just a name for different Bastone. name for English? It's Bastone. It's Bastone. Yep, it's the paradox. Now. Um, it's interesting you say this because I've, I've been trying to do research and obviously I don't speak French and I don't speak Chinese or Russian, but we, we credit Luther Burbank um, here for a lot of the testing that was done, early testing. And I, I, I just know as an American kid, I've always, you know, we invented the TV and all these things and I, I'm always skeptical of the scholarship of what I think I know to be true. So the French, uh, and I have French friends, but the transna translation that usually my French friends don't know anything about botany. And so we, they don't know if there's a gentleman like Luther Burbank in early French history that possibly crossed some wallets in, in Europe. Uh, so it, it's possible that what, what I think I know is Bastogne or French, uh, I don't know where it got its name, French walnut, even though Bastogne is a Portuguese name, so right next door. Um, so uh, it is Bastogne as far as a simple uh, thought of what it is. Uh, but uh, it's, and you know, um, also as an American, I wonder how centric uh, these thoughts are um, of course, we have guidebooks for trees and birds and whatever, and you could find out what the names of those things are. And I, I had a, um, well, a, 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 some Indian friends, East Indian friends, and I, I said, do you guys have guidebooks in India? And he, he says, no, they're all in English. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, shoot, that's crazy. And so, you know, they're in, in you know, because Juglans Regia, the English walnut, it, I think is in Japan and, and China as well. It, it's just not an abundant, but it's a native tree there. Um, you just got to wonder if they had early botanists there that did that. And uh, we just think it's something we invented. But I, I can't tell you because I don't speak that language and I haven't seen the books. And, or any, if anybody has some thoughts on that, please send them my way. Well, when I turn some bowls out of that, I'll, I'll, it sounds much more exotic to say baston than uh, You'll pay for that extra baston. <laughs> yeah. Now those pallets, 100 chunks of those reject pallets are about 40 cents a chunk. Gosh, can't beat that. $100, $100 for a pallet and there's 350 <clears throat> to 400 pieces on a pallet. 
Wow. When I come up and visit you, I'll, I'll bring you a few just so you can turn a Bastogne bowl. Oh, I got plenty of Bastogne here. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Come on, everybody with questions. I know you guys probably have some business to do, but. Oh, no. Nothing important. I think Shannon's Mike, already said that. Mike, you said that uh, the, the places where they're cutting down a bunch of trees, they're, they're not interested in dealing with, uh, you know, individuals like like us, but what about if we could arrange a, a flatbed or a dump truck or whatever to come get a whole load? Uh, could that happen? I think so. Uh, my buddy Skyler, who's the uh, the head of all this, he, he's a pretty generous guy and uh, I, I, he hates to see this wood go to waste. It just kills him. Um, it, it really does. And uh, I could say, hey, Skyler, the club wants to get over there. Could you just throw half a dozen English walnut logs in the back of their trucks and I'm sure he'd do it. And I, and I say English walnut because I think that's the stuff you're going to want. The burly stuff uh, is going to be real heavy and um, it's going to do a lot of cleaning. You're going to have to high pressure wash. You're going to need big saws and uh, the English walnut's there for the taking. It's, it's, it's fantastic wood and it's just stacked up in mountains of it. I, I got to show you more pictures of that since nobody's uh, yeah. commenting here. Let yeah. me get that queued up here. Um, where do I have those pictures? So while Mike's doing that, we did have our um, we have our uh, wood com cutting committee chair here, and we have gone out on some of our uh, wood cutting gatherings to get walnut. We had some in Winters last year, I think it was, and we went out to a guy who had a pile like this and just sitting there, and they said, "Take all you want." Oh yeah, this this uh, this is all gonna get uh, burned up. Yep. And that, those are all 24, 30 inch logs, and they're they're all quilted English walnut, and mm. we also call this wood marble cake. Um, it's got a beautiful marbling figure in it. Oh, I've heard that name before. Yep, it's an old term. I just saw that one. That's marbling one. cake. Yeah. Yep. Any major woodworker would be looking for that let's see what does quilted mean mike curl cool thank you yep it's a it's um you can use that term uh for a lot of different figures fiddleback curl tiger all these you're looking at my game camera there sorry <laughs> i shouldn't be doing this there's nothing bad here Just, um, let's stop share i got it i got it i'm Go ahead. Who had the question? Hmm, maybe we lost them. Oh, there, there, I, had, I had one more picture here um, that I can't seem to find here. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Let me share my screen and show you this. There's Skyler there on the left. That's a 6,000 pound burrow. Wow. And that's all veneer. And that was just uh, ripped right out of the ground with an excavator. There's Skyler on the left there, uh, top-notch guy, hard worker. That's all he knows is pulling out orchards. That's what he's done all his life. What do you mean by veneer? What do you mean by veneer, Mark? So look at these really... In, just in this area here, they're really tight pins. Um, uh, really, uh, so this wood will not have any defect in it. So veneers are made out of really fine woods that are tight, uh, tightly grained. Um, I have pictures of other burrows here that are not veneer quality. And they're actually, I had some right here. Um, what would those be? I, you know, actually, th this right here was, is not veneer quality. So look at the beauty of this wood here. Let's move that around. That's not veneer quality, and it, it's still an incredible burl, the, uh, the one here on the right. Uh, th the pins here are just much bigger. Um, the, the grain isn't as tight as a pin burl. Um, you can might see some... This tighter area down here on the lower left, that would be a veneer, but 
you can't just take little pieces of the tree and call it veneer. It has to be the whole thing because um, the, the tree itself, the, 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 we'll call it the, uh, the onion, um, is going to be put on a veneer mill. Oops, that's, that's it. Let's move that over. So the, the veneer mill will find the center of this particular onion or cookie, and it's going to peel it. It's just going to put it on a lathe and just peel sheets and sheets and sheets and sheets of this off, and it, um, they'll match them all up together, and that's what you call veneer. And then that's okay. going to go into um, car dashboards and fancy, fancy items. Uh, that's what that would happen. So that's a veneer quality. Thank you. Uh, your buddy is selling those to somebody to, to work them? Yeah, an incredible story there. Um, I told you the bottom has dropped out of the market. You know, Mercedes Benz and Jaguar, uh, all those fancy cars would be buying these decades ago. But Skyler says they're just those folks don't come around anymore because they can they can make plastic uh, wood look just as just like uh, real wood. And uh, of course, they're putting a plastic coating over the wood anyway so they just figured why don't we just make a fake wood and and so the 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 bottom of that market has dropped off but there are people speculating on that market coming back and Skyler's literally selling hundreds of thousands of, of pounds of this burl to these speculators and what they do it's amazing they build um um they're they're buying land on uh, major rivers like the Mequalamy or the Tuolumne River or the Stanislaus and um, they get permits for this and they they will take these burls and set them in fresh water uh, they'll build a like a, a little side stream of one of these rivers and as long as there's fresh water on these uh, burls at all time they don't change over time they'll last decades without rot or anything you can't just stick them in a pond or anything because they'll 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 the rot but if they keep them in fresh water they they last and so these folks are speculators and uh they're buying these barrels and throwing them in these uh, freshwater ponds hmm. interesting so mike you said that they took that huge burl like he was standing on and put it on a lathe to peel it off that's one method there's also uh, i just saw. was trying to imagine how you mounted and turned something that big that's just kind of incredible yeah, the, you know, the first, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight times around, you just got a thin little bit and it gets wider and wider and wider. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually it comes to a core and they just toss it. Wow. Yeah, that you can see stuff like that on YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Mm. But there's a, that's one method. That's a, a, a lathe mill that would do that. But uh, they have bandsaw uh, veneer cutters as well. Hey, Mike, I saw earlier on YouTube, um, earlier this month, you posted that you were rough turning some walnut um, bowls. Are you doing that instead of the oak this year? Oh, no, I'm doing both. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I've got one, one or two weeks of walnut left, which is way past when I normally do it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to get on my... Uh, my oak uh, i've got one big oak tree that will satisfy my whole season and if I, you probably i don't if you put, follow me on facebook you saw that big oak tree mm -hmm. that i showed it's a incredible uh, massive uh, wow. seven and a half foot diameter uh, oak tree it's wow. gonna be gonna be platters <laughs> that is if my back holds up <laughs> no i'm holding up just fine it's I just got to tell myself I don't need to do this anymore. But it's like a, it's such a love to do. I can't, I can't uh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's so exciting to cut into wood to see what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. That surprise, that point where it, it opens up and you're like, oh, yep. Well, that's a yep. nice one. I had a couple Sawyer uh, wood turners out with me this winter and. I got a really like a four and a half foot diameter, real straight white oak log. And uh, they were pretty surprised what came out of that. And I, I saw the excitement on their faces. And mm -hmm. I went, oh, that's way cool. Mm -hmm. Well, good, everybody. Thanks for having me. I, I guess um, I should probably walk back to my house before it gets dark.
Right.